patients need to have not price transparency. Hmm. They don't really, when we did testing on this, patients don't want to know the contracted rate between the insurance network and the provider. Okay. They don't really care. All we care about as human beings is what does it cost, it cost me? me. Yep. And so by giving the patient price certainty, a fixed price where they know they're out of pocket ahead of time for every covered service, it becomes very motivating for them to go to higher quality providers, which also they can see transparently will cost them less. Welcome to the Self-Funded with Spencer podcast. Healthcare is broken and we aim to fix it one conversation at a time. So Wally Goma, co-founder of Simple Pay. How are you, sir? Doing better than I deserve. Better than you deserve. <laughs> it was, that's, a, that's a Dave Ramsey. Oh, yeah. It? I'm a big, yeah, I'm a big a Dave, Dave Ramsey, Ramsey follower. Fan. I'm a big follower. I, lo I love that. I love when people come up with their, their phrases, you know. But you have uh, an interesting nickname. You have Captain Passion, yeah. which you shared with me. I'd love to at least tell the story of the origins of that nickname before we dive sure. into the podcast fully. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I've been blessed and fortunate to have been a part of a lot of startup organizations. And, you know, I always believe play to your strengths. And, uh, you know, as the chief storyteller and the evangelist about, you know, the good news of things that we were doing, you know, I became, you know, kind of called uh, Captain Passion, you know, the guy that's going to go share, you know, what we're doing to the industry with passion. And uh, you went so in so far as actually putting yeah, it on business cards. We right? had it on yeah. business cards. Yeah. So some of my business partners, uh, a guy named Dem Bishop, yep. uh, was president of Holmes Murphy, uh, one of my dearest friends and business partners. He was the chief maker upper. Okay. Um, our chief operating <laughs> officer, she was the chief cleaner upper. Chief cleaner upper. And, okay. uh, and then there was me, Captain and passion. We had another gentleman on our team, Brad Bierman, but we could never really come up with a creative name for him. But he was—he just had a normal title. He, he was—he was, yeah. was the—he was the technology, you know, wizard. So, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm sure that's fun to actually when you sit down with a new prospect or somebody and they read your business card and says Captain Passion. It's yeah. a nice icebreaker, right? Yeah. You got to explain what passion's yeah. about, yeah. otherwise people are like, "What are you? Like, what are you well, doing? Well, well, you sit over on the other side <laughs> of the right. table, please. That's right. You don't want to creep anybody yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Captain Passion, but I'll, I'll refer to you obviously as Wally for this episode. But the purpose of the day, right? I've been dying to talk about simple. Pay. I was just sharing with you off camera that a couple of gentlemen that have been on this podcast that were with Simple Pay for a period of time and no longer there, even after leaving, were espousing the virtues of what Simple Pay is doing for the market. And I'm going, okay, I got to dig into this and yeah. actually learn about it. And I've seen it come up in passing, um, but really hadn't had a chance to sink my teeth into what you guys do. And so we're going to, that's going to be the gist of today. Awesome. But one of the best things I've discovered um, to kind of get to know somebody is, is, Hear some of your story, right? Yeah. The motivators of why you do what you do, how you got in the industry, things like that. So, Wally, give me some of your backstory, and then there's a couple uh, really key experiences I want to ask you about after that. Yeah, well, I mean, I will tell you, first, from a professional experience in the motivators, you know, I started my career in the Houston Medical Center working for a provider system as a, as a financial controller. Uh, defected to the other side of the fence, worked as president for one of the national medical insurance carriers, uh, worked as an employee benefit consultant before, you know, really finding my stride over the last 15 years and mm -hmm. starting up new companies in the healthcare space to try to, to try to change the world. And, uh, you know, I think it's those experiences having been in lots of corners of the industry where you realize everyone's trying their best to do a mm -hmm. good job to make a difference. Uh, we often work against each other, yep. you know, in terms of, you know, what, what area of the healthcare industry we're in. Uh, but it's those sort of broad professional experiences that help me, you know, sort of look at the big picture to say, what could we do, you know, to create better healthcare for patients and, uh, you know, better and simpler insurance model for, for members. Well, you've seen it. You, so you just don't hear in your background. So you've been on the provider side, mm -hmm. you're on the carrier side, you're on the broker side, and then you got obviously the more innovation and tech and they're building health plans and things like that. So, so that's a pretty um, diverse diverse uh, vantage point to be yeah. able to build from. How long were you a consultant though? How long were you doing the, or performing that role? You know, I started with Holmes Murphy in 2003 and uh, that's really where I, I came into employee benefit consulting out of an insurance company. And uh, I still I still think about, you know, that transition. You know, I left a big insurance company, had 1,500 employees that reported to me in, in the organization that I led. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to show these brokers how insurance is really <laughs> done. And uh, I think I was a month in, and I, I actually called my wife on the way home when, you know, on, on, on the drive about a month in at Holmes Murphy. And I said, oh, I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> I'm like in way over my head. Like, yeah. I, I don't know anything really about, yeah. you know, how, you know, how the system really works. And, uh, you know, again, just, you know, Thanks, thanks to the to Dem Bishop who took me under his wing and taught me a lot of what I uh, I, I, I learned. Well, that and, transition yeah. from carrier to consulting seems mm -hmm. to be. I went the opposite direction. I started on the broker side and went to the carrier to side, the carrier but it side. seems like a pretty natural transition.
transition to spend time selling products to brokers, but then obviously they have a pretty good uh, basis of knowledge for how these insurance products work, you know, how to sell them, how to understand the differentiators in the market. And I think that gives you a pretty good training ground to go in and then invert that process and start representing an employer. It, it was a transition moving yeah. from selling a product. Yeah to actually now you're becoming somebody's advisor, somebody's trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful, you know, that I uh, <laughs> had the, the, cha the transition, the pay there was a lot of patience and tolerance for, for me to make that transition, mm -hmm. you know, by, by the people I worked with. But it was, it was moving from selling a product and being a product specialist to being an advisor. And I think fortunately I get to sort of draw from both of those types of skill sets, which are a little bit different, um, you know, from each other and, you know, that I use today and, you know, what we do. We, we consultatively sell products, yep. you know, because we're, we're back in the product space, um, but we're doing it in a consultative way that really focuses on, you know, what's best for, you know, the buyer. Well, and you've had a couple catalysts. I want I mentioned or alluded to some stories yeah. uh, that I think show a profound reason why you do what you do. And so I'll, I'll leave it up to you which one you want to do first. But the two key stories that I know of, obviously, you had a, a cycling accident. And mm -hmm. then also you've lost a significant amount of weight uh, yeah. about 20 years ago. So whichever order chronologically you want to dig into. But I know those are both yeah. pivotal moments I'll, for you. I'll do them in chronological yeah, okay. order. Okay. So, you know... Um, you know, after after joining, you know, Holmes Murphy on the broker side, I actually made a transition into co-founding ACAP Health. It was a wholly owned subsidiary uh, where we were developing and distributing different products. And and one of those products was a program called Naturally Slim, okay. uh, you know, became one of the country's largest pre-diabetes and metabolic syndrome programs. Uh, really, we worked with, you know, millions of lives around the country, clients like Google, big state governments, universities, many of the largest hospital mm -hmm. systems. And it was really one of the first programs in the country in that space to be covered by the major insurance carriers as a preventive medical client. Mm. And uh, we made a difference in the lives of millions of people, reversing their clinical risk factors and helping them, I say, as a byproduct to lose weight. And, and I don't believe in coincidences, you know, before, you know, really, you know, stepping into that role a year, you know, several years before that, I had actually lost uh, about 140 pounds. Um, in full disclosure, yeah. I used to be six foot eight. I'm five foot seven. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's part of the loss, right? <laughs> no, Me but too. Yeah, that's yeah. It. But, yeah. It, but, you know, you look at it and say, was it those experiences in realizing how people struggle with their weight? They feel like they're failures on diets. What we learned was, no, um, diets have failed them. And, and the things that we were bringing forward, you know, were really life changing, again, really for millions of lives. Well, so. can, can I dig into that a little further? Yeah. What, what was some of the methodology behind Naturally Slim, like the, how, yeah. how you did that? You know, it's, you know I, we kind of call it the Fosbury flop okay. uh, of, of, uh, of, of nutrition. You, we, you mentioned this uh, last yeah. week and I, I knew what it was, but I think for the audience's perspective, the Fosbury flop, let's, let's it's, talk it's, about where that know, came from. It's a, it's a fa I think everybody should Google it, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great true story of um, Dick Fosbury, 1968 Olympics um, in Mexico City. So he was a high jumper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before Dick Fosbury, everybody went over the high jump stomach first. Mm -hmm. And he shows up at the Olympics and he gets to the bar, rotates and goes over, the, you know, with the bar under his back. And so no one had done it that way yeah. before. Yeah. And, you know, he was criticized. What are you doing? What science later came back and proved is that it's just geometry is science that you can actually clear a higher bar if right as you approach it you rotate and, and let the bar go under your back versus going stomach yeah. first so we used to say naturally slim was the fosbury flop of of nutrition before that point the focus was on what you eat eat this don't eat that yeah. what we realized is no 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 it's not what you eat it's how you eat and when you eat there's a reason why some people are always naturally slim even though they sit across the table from us and eat whatever they mm -hmm. want to eat. We say, hey, God loves those people more. <laughs> um, but what we now understand is that there is a scientific reason on how and when they eat their mm. food and naturally slim, which is now branded Wonder. So okay. we've had a successful exit of that uh, business. That business was sold, um, was one of the ACAP uh, you know, products that, uh, was a, was a real core of that business. That's amazing. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's out and, uh, and it's, it, I like to say it's, it's sort of been sold and gone to college, right? Gone to college. It's, it's off to now, college off now. To college and, and doing, yeah. and doing amazing things. That's, that's really cool. I pressed it yeah. and Pomical mentioned that uh, on the podcast probably about six months ago. And I, I, I admit I hadn't, hadn't heard of it, yeah. but it sounds like a he tremendous was the one, amount of He success. was the one that actually introduced us to Marsha Upson, okay. who was the family nurse practitioner and was really her and her mom, you know, that were seeing these observations in the real world. And 
and then we brought it into the insurance industry and kind of gave it legs. But Preston's the one who gets credit okay. uh, for getting us connected with Marsha. Otherwise, uh, the, th- the great things we did yeah. would have never happened. Well, and it's funny. You said you, you used it for yourself. It's kind of like the hair club for yeah. men that you're also a client, right? Or so, you yeah. know, those old, old infamous commercials. But do you think that helped you in your ability to sort of articulate the value because you experienced it yourself? You know, Spencer, I, I would go to meetings and I would talk about these things um, of what we know. And I think sometimes people would look at it and go, well, what does this guy know about, you know, what it means to struggle with weight? But then when I would share my personal story, you know, then it, then it sort of de-armed and go, mm-hmm. t- talk to me more about this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, weight loss is super personal, you know, for, you know, the 80% of adult Americans that struggle with their weight, they think about losing weight every day. And we wanted to give them hope that there is a better way. And it, uh, I'll tell you, it's, I've never seen anything that as a business person, um, we were doing to affect, you know, the quantity and quality of people's lives just as much well, see, as Well, see, that's we what doing. I've been talking about this quite a bit. And, you know, I, I talk pretty regularly about being uh, an advocate of intermittent fasting and mm-hmm. how that's going to sort of help me control my weight. As that's I when eat. you eat, right? It's when you, you eat, you eat yeah. when you're When you're catabolic, not you're anabolic, yeah. right? You let your cells deplete the glucose from your prior meal. We didn't yeah. know what intermittent fasting was when we well, were doing it. probably it, wasn't but now, that But now it's a, it's, a, it's a widely understood and recognized, you know, area in nutrition sciences. Well, what I respect, though, is I was lamenting and have been lamenting about how do you apply these methodologies in a group setting, right? How do you do this at an employer scale rather than just get to one individual that makes a change in their one life? Is there a way that you could be doing this on a group basis? Well, so we were fortunate. We started with the train the trainer. Let's get people in a classroom. But, you know, you quickly run out of operational scale. We were one of the things because you think about all the things we were doing here. We were also bringing forward for the first time digital therapeutics on a broad scale, like pre-YouTube, right? These, these were things that what we were bringing forward. Roughly? You know, we started the business and the mission, I like to say, in 2007, but things okay. really started to accelerate in 2010. You know, it's 12 years ago, right? But yeah. 12 years ago was an eternity. It wasn't like yeah, we were yeah. all having smartphones in our pockets the way mm-hmm. we do today. Mm-hmm. Um, but being able to do things on a digital level, on a broad scale, with, with curriculum that's grounded in good science, um, you know, it's again, it's pretty special. You can really reverse your clinical risk factors in a very brief period of time without medication if we can naturally teach individuals how to let the metabolic engine work the way that it was supposed to. That's amazing. And I, I love that. I don't want to go. I want to keep know, going we on there. Go the whole, we can spend I, I, our we whole time, spend the whole there, time yeah. But the other story, right? I want to hear the story about the cycling accident because I think that's a, probably a more direct connection yeah. point between what you're doing here. And yeah, that, that really this podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance a premier medical stop-loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white-glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight. Dot com. That, that yeah. really affects more of the simple pay. So, you know, after being in the healthcare industry for a lot of years on different sides, you know, I, um, you know, I had the, I guess the experience of getting hit by a car riding my bike. I used to pretend I was Lance Armstrong on the, <laughs> on the weekends without, the, without the performance enhancing okay, drugs. Okay, fair enough. You know, Full you, disclosure, you can yeah. do, a, you can do a blood test. Uh, but you know, I got hit by a car, you know, uh, lady texting and driving. You can imagine the story. And, you know, I got, I got scooped up off the road, you know, rushed to the nearest hospital and, uh, you know, laying there in a, a mess. I mean, I was a what mess. What were the extent of your injury? You know, I, I, my left arm, I, I will not describe it for those uh, listeners that might, mm-hmm. uh, might, might not uh, have a strong stomach, but, but, I, but it, was, it, was a, it was a left arm injury and, um, and it was a mess. You know, so I'm laying there, they stabilized me and uh, the surgeon who is attending to me at the ER, they called him in as an orthopedic surgeon and a trauma surgeon, came to me and said, listen, I can't fix you. Mm. He goes, the extent of your injuries 
are so severe, there's really only one surgeon in town that can fix you, but I'm running into some business friction mm. because that surgeon practices medicine at a competing hospital. <laughs> so this is happening while you're laying in the ER. You said stabilized, yes. but I mean, you're in limbo at the moment. I'm right? in limbo. Yeah. They're trying to figure out whether they're going to helicopter me to this hospital or that hospital because mm. they, they, they clearly can't, you know, um, treat me at the hospital that I was in. And, and thank God that I knew enough about the healthcare system mm -hmm. uh, to say to the doctor, say, listen, I am telling you as the patient, I want to be transferred to the doctor that you feel like is going to be able to perform the surgery the best. And they ended up, so, you know, you had two hospitals basically competing for who's going to keep the patient, right? Yeah. There is the decision on what's best for the patient clinically, yeah. or is it about the money? Well, that's not the type of competition we really want to like facilitate in, in this industry. But yeah. thank God for the doctor that knew the person to refer you, you know? to and even felt, you know, obviously felt compelled to tell you. I mean, if it's at that extent where it's like, I cannot do this, but I know somebody that does it. There is right. no business decision, in my opinion, at that point. It's get him to the person that can fix you know, it. Yeah. We, have to be, we have to be transparent to say that a lot of decisions that happen in the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I say healthcare industry, I'm, I'm including everything from, you know, employer-sponsored plans to, you know, to, to providers that are delivering care. You know, a lot of it is motivated, as we know, by money. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a book that I would commend to, you know, all the listeners uh, today is a book by Dr. Marty Macri mm -hmm. called The Price We Pay. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to have, you know, dinner with him, uh, you know, several weeks ago. And uh, I tell you, it's a gift to the industry. I think everyone in our industry should read it. And it reveals how money can influence decision making, you know, across the board. And, um, and we need to, and we need to be better. We need to be better. I, I would agree a hundred percent. So, so you got transferred and by yeah. the way, Dr. Marty Macri, if he hears this, I would love to have you on. Uh, <laughs> I've been one of the, my bucket list guys to have on. Um, but so you got transferred uh, to the hospital. They were able to fix your arm. You said you've got maybe 80% use of it now. Yeah. Or, you yeah. know, I mean, I, again, I, didn't think, and I don't think the doctors and Dr. Casey Cates, who was, who was my surgeon, I don't think he thought it would, uh, it would have as much function as it does today. Wow. So, so I, you know, I don't even really think about it anymore, except for, you know, the, the experience at getting bounced around as a patient. Mm. And then what happens afterwards, you know, imagine the boxes and boxes of paperwork, yeah. you know, the bills and the EOBs and subrogation, like it is, we've made such a complex system and I could never figure out who I need to pay what to. And I mean, it was all of that experience mm -hmm. and much more, you know, that led, that led me to kind of think back of if we were going to start from the beginning to create a new model of insurance, you know, what would it look like? And so when, when was the actual genesis of what is now Simple Pay? How long ago yeah, was so, that? Yeah, um, so, you know, one of my, my co-founder in Simple Pay is a gentleman named Scott Shane Vogel. Okay. Uh, Scott was the CEO and founder of Compass, which has mm -hmm. been sold to Alight. Uh, so he had a successful exit in that business uh, to Alight. Uh, but, you know, Compass, you know, one of the, mm -hmm. the largest patient navigation price transparency businesses. He and I started, you know, putting our heads together uh, back in 2017. And then in 2018, you know, we kind of, you know, formally said, let's let's do this, you know, to start designing a, a new model of insurance. Um, since then, we've been fortunate to have added Dr. Eric Bricker to yes, our team. Yes, know him very well. Uh, yeah. You know, really highly regarded. I think he's the uh, he's the most well-known of, uh, of the three of us. And, well, he's, uh, he's, the, he's got the whiteboard yeah. uh, reach that I, I want to be when I grow yeah. up. You his, know, uh, his, 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 uh, a, a healthcare Z, yep. you yep. know, in a lot of ways we got the band back together again. And, That's uh, great. you know, between, you know, Scott, who is one of the, I mean, gurus in the industry, uh, came at, he was, he was actually the chief revenue uh, cycle officer for Baylor Scott and White Health System. Okay. Uh, and, and really a, a consultant to many of the largest hospital systems in the country before coming to Compass. Uh, you know, he and I kind of decided, you know, what would, what would a new insurance model look like mm -hmm. if we were starting from the beginning? So when did you know when you had those early conversations up until you thought it was something you could take to market? Was there a, a moment in time where you really figured out that you were onto something or was it a slow and gradual effort? You know, I, you know, with, with a lot of things, right. You try this, it doesn't work. You try that. It doesn't work. Um, what we started to realize is that when we got rid of insurance complexity, mm -hmm. patients started behaving like consumers do in the real world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to separate patients from consumers because, you know, it's not like we're buying, you know, a TV. You know, healthcare I think, is more personal, more important. You know, I'm biased on when I say that. Yeah, but we spend more time researching the TVs. Than we, we spend do. more yeah. time. Well, we have more information <laughs> yeah, at yeah. our fingertips. And it's easier to get. Yep. It's easier. Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't be. It should be easier to make good decisions in healthcare. Um, 
And so anyway, the, you know, I think as, as we started experimenting with different plan designs and payment models and, you know, all of that really, you know, came to, you know, des to creating the model that we use today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've continued to adjust and perfect. Um, and I can, I can talk a little bit about the results we have, yeah. but, but I'll tell you, grounded in all of this is not just to simplify healthcare for the sake of simplification. Um, the health insurance industry ranks dead last in a study that's called the Global Brand Simplicity Index. It okay. ranks every industry from simplest to the most complicated. Health insurance is always ranked dead last as the most complicated industry that a consumer would interact with. And we wanted to not only simplify to create a better experience, but to get individuals to be naturally self-motivated mm. to select higher quality care from the providers in their community. Well, is the complexity element the one, the main element you were solving for? Or is it payment and complexity? I mean, like, tell me the actual pillars of things that you were tackling head on. If you think about what makes health insurance so complicated, it's obvious, right? Mm -hmm. There's these confusing plan design terms, deductible, coinsurance, copay, out-of-pocket maximum. Only 4% of plan participants, if you give them those terms and ask them to match it to the definition, can match all four terms to the definition. Oh, really? Only 4%. Wow. So we go to these open enrollment meetings. We keep talking about, you know, these things, but individuals just nod their head. They don't really know how a, how coinsurance works. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it coin insurance. They think it has something to <laughs> yeah. do with money. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they don't really know. So we said, listen, you don't have to have coinsurance and deductibles to buy a TV. Could you actually create an insurance model that gets rid of all that plan design complexity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and give gives a cov gives a, every covered medical and pharmacy service a price tag? You know the price of everything to you as the patient before you go. Our whole thesis is you can't be a consumer of anything unless you know the price of everything ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just it. And I, I watched one of y'all's uh, YouTube videos, which is actually really well done. Uh, funny, it was the juxtaposition of the simple pay plan versus a traditional plan. And that, you know, the the humorous guy standing there like, don't you understand embedded versus aggregate? And I thought it, <laughs> it's funny, but it's funny because it's true, it's right? True. Because nobody really understands that. You said 4% of the people can actually successfully right. identify those terms. I'm in the industry. I still have difficulty to kind of coming up with, well, what do I, what am I going to pay if I have to go to this particular uh, facility or something like that. We, you don't know it. We, we all do, right? Yeah. I, and one of my friends is a CEO of a, of a large hospital system. And, uh, and he used to, he used to tell me, say, Wally, when the bills and EOBs for, for care that's come, being delivered to my family within our own system, I would wait three or four or five months and tell my family, don't pay anything because we don't know who yeah. we're going to owe what to. Yep. And even after the bills and EOBs come in, we still don't know. We spend a lot of energy in our industry, as you know, talking about surprise bills mm -hmm. in healthcare. Usually that's linked to out-of-network care. My opinion is every bill that you get is a surprise bill. Oh, you it's never absolutely. really know what Well, my favorite thing is you go in and they say, okay, we're going to run your insurance and here's what you owe. And then you go, well, what, what, is, what is actually being billed? Like, That's how much right. is it going to cost? Oh, That's we're right. not quite sure yet. We'll send you a bill later. That's but we right. know what you have to pay today in order to receive this care. It's, it's pretty, yeah. it's not even nonsense. It's perverse, in it my is. opinion. Yeah. It is. So you're seeking to simplify that process. So why yeah. don't we take this moment? Let's actually describe Simple Pay in a let's little more that. detail. What the solution is, how it works, and then I'll do some follow-up after so, that. So think about how you buy anything else in life. You might know the price. <laughs> You might do some research on, you know, what's the quality. Um, and that, that's step one for us, right? Mm -hmm. We give the patient two pieces of information they should have had years ago um, around quality and around price. Okay. Uh, on the quality side, I like to say we're not reinventing the wheel. Nobody has to go to open enrollment to know that five stars is better than three stars, yep, right? We know simple. that. Uh, give them credible information that's easy to understand. Don't have to go to medical school to be able to know this doctor is higher quality than this doctor. So that's step one. Okay. Um, and combine that by giving them a fixed price out of pocket for every covered medical and pharmacy service. Okay. Where price tags will be lower for higher quality care, as they should be. Should be. Yep. Higher quality care generates more efficient delivery of medicine, fewer complications, yeah. readmissions, infection rates, never events, you know, never leave a surgical instrument in a patient. It's a real thing. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> We set lower price tags if you go to higher quality providers and those price tags, and this is key, those price tags are fixed and all inclusive. Okay. So let's say Wally was having, you know, his hospital stay for his bicycling accident. Okay. Instead of 
deductibles and coinsurance mm-hmm. and and not really knowing who you're going to go what to, you would know that your hospital stay has one price tag behind it and it covers everything that happens from when you're admitted until you're discharged. Okay. Okay. One price where that price, again, is lower around quality. Well, in that instance, that's more of an emergent condition, right, where you don't really have a lot of choice of where you go. But talk to me about something that's a non-emergent example of of the same thing. So I get to pick between this facility and this facility or this doctor and this doctor, maybe the range of pay and and how you do that quality scoring. So so let's say you're going to go to an ologist, cardiologist, oncologist, neurologist. In our model, you can go to any provider you want in the country. We have partnered with Aetna. Uh, and Maritain, their TPA, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, business, you know, to make this available on a national level. And we tell everyone, like, we're not narrowing networks. We're the trip advisor of healthcare. Okay. Go wherever you want to go. Yeah. But we're going to empower you with this two pieces of information you should have had before around quality, around price. So you're searching for an ologist. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go to any cardiologist you want. But if you go to a provider that we've ranked as being top quality, your price, your simple pay amount, technically it's just a copay, yep. is going to be lower than if you go somewhere else. Okay. What's really important here is in our model, we've learned that healthcare is a team sport. You cannot be a top quality specialist if you don't have admitting privileges to a top quality hospital service line. Okay. So if we can just get the patient to make one good decision of the doctor they're going to go to, that generally leads to top quality throughout their episode of care. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So what is the range of, of that potential copay? Like, I mean, we're talking sure. 10, 15 bucks or how, how far yeah. does so, that range go? So our go? plan designs are, are ACA compliant, right? Okay. So we're, we're going to have, you know, you know, gold, silver, okay. you know, level plans ge- generally in terms of, of value, you know, so an office visit copay for a specialist might be $25 for a top quality uh, could be lower if it's going to be a richer medical plan. Mm-hmm. Um, could be you know ten or fifteen dollars. Mm-hmm. Maybe you go to a provider that we would rank as being average. Uh, yellow, you know, we use colors: green, okay. yellow, red. Uh, you know, that might be you know forty dollars. And if you go to a provider that we would say maybe not your best choice, uh, you know, that might be a, a sixty, seventy dollar uh, charge. So that's for your office visit, yeah. all inclusive, all inclusive, all inclusive okay. right? Covers everything that happens from when you walk in the door, you walk out the door, even if they did it in an office lab test or an EKG. The point of this is, patients need to have not price transparency. They don't really, when we did testing on this, patients don't want to know the contracted rate between the insurance network and the provider. Okay. They don't really care. All we care about as human beings is what does it cost, it cost me? me. Yep. And so by giving the patient price certainty, a fixed price where they know they're out of pocket ahead of time for every covered service, it becomes very motivating for them to go to higher quality providers, which also they can see transparently will cost them less with certainty. I like the price certainty, that that, that terminology. That makes a lot of sense to me. And even then, right, you you still guide them through the choice uh, steps of that choice. And ultimately, it is still their decision, right? There's not enforcement. There's just incentivization through a lower cost, right? That's right. The presumption, though, is that even that delta of 25 or 50 bucks might be enough of an incentive to get them to choose a higher quality provider. That's right. I think also knowing if I'm a, a, a patient, right? If I go, oh, well, it's all going to cost me less and that person is a higher quality provider, like why wouldn't I drive an extra mile? Maybe, That's right. Or whatever that, that, that calculation may be in my head. I think tying those two things together as a consumer of healthcare makes a lot of sense because yeah. it's not just the dollars. I actually want high quality care. At That's the same right. Time. That's right. There's another Fosbury flop thing in this, okay, uh, I in hear this the model other, yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, the narrow networks, you know, high-performing mm-hmm. network models, we actually think that we should have been doing the opposite of those now that we okay. understand what's going on. Every hospital system, as an example, has some clinical service lines they're great at, mm-hmm. some they're okay at, some not so much. Okay. So you, we really need to have patients that are going to the hospitals that have the best clinical, you know, one hospital may be best in town at cardiology, but not the place to go for orthopedics. Okay. Um, and we need to combine it with the best physicians who have admitting privileges at those hospitals okay. and measuring physician performance, not the way our industry has historically done it at the tax ID level where 10 doctors may operate, you know, or mm. practice in one, in one practice together under one tax ID. We need to measure the individual doctors at that individual NPI level that we, that okay. we, t- we call this matching and using, you know, behind the scene technology to match best providers uh, healthcare is a team sport, you know, has been proven to deliver the best results. Well, so let's, let's drill this down into kind of an employer profile, like the sure. fit, right? Because I think I often will hear solutions on the, uh, the podcast and then I'm trying to sort of drill in. All right. The theoretical sounds amazing. Like right. let's talk about the practical. So yeah. 
who would benefit from this? Well, there, there's yeah. another part to the simple pay model. Oh, okay, please. That yeah. helps to, to that helps to kind of you know confirm is an employer a good fit for this okay. or not. And it was a big learning for us that telling a patient, "Here's your price. You have price certainty." Mm-hmm. Um, did not create simplification when all those bills and EOBs came in the door because okay. they could never figure out who to pay what to. Okay. So we had to get rid of all that. Mm. And probably one of the most transformative things we're doing to really kind of change the way our industry works is that we've eliminated bills from providers and EOBs in this model and replaced it with a single monthly statement. Okay. So, so how do we do that, yeah. right? So patient you know, see, has care from a provider, Provider submits their claim to Aetna Maritain. The network discount is applied. What Aetna is doing is paying those providers the contracted rate in full. Okay. And not reducing the provider's reimbursement for the patient responsibility. Okay. Which if you think about it, it's like how every other industry works. Mm -hmm. You know, if I go to a retailer and I buy something with my credit card, the retailer is paid in full by the credit card company. And 30 days later, you get a monthly statement from your bank. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you show your Aetna Maritain ID card, providers are paid in full. Okay. Always. Okay. And then the patient gets one monthly statement from their health plan, and the amount will match. And it's that combination of price certainty, quality transparency, and then you get a monthly statement that shows, hey, you you actually owe what you what we showed you you were going to owe, yeah. that creates the engagement rates that really went through the roof. So that's not, is that the copay element then or is that? Okay. It is. Okay. So, so you're not so even you, paying the copay uh, up front. No. Either. Oh, you go to the doctor's office, show your ID card, you leave because providers are paid in full. Ah, you okay. go to the pharmacy, you pick up your drug. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. go to the pharmacy, you pick up your medication, you show your ID card. Providers are always going to be paid in full. Okay. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy that we don't do that the way every other industry yeah, does. Yeah. It's almost like if I went to a retailer to buy a television and they don't collect some of it from me and some of it from American Express. No, they're paid in full and then your bank settles up with you yeah. 30 days later. That's what we're doing here. Pay providers in full, let them focus on practicing high quality care mm-hmm. and then let's send from the health plan a single monthly statement where the price on that statement will match the price that they knew okay. they were going to be responsible for. One more thing. Simple. One more. I'm going to go yeah. one more place. Okay. And, and this is a big part of our motivation in, in us trying to change the world is the recognition that for many American families, they don't have over you know $500 laying around for an un- to pay the out-of-pocket cost of an unexpected health care event. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, on a good day, Spencer, we're, we're using high interest rate credit cards and taking out payday loans yeah. to pay that out-of-pocket cost, on a bad day, about 25% of Americans avoid medically needed health care yeah. because they're making choices between do I pay my mortgage this month or do I have health care that's needed for my family. So in this model, we've added a really cool financial well-being benefit. When your monthly statement comes in, you can pay the balance in full um, or you can pay the minimum amount due and you can revolve that balance with a 0% line of credit that's available for all health plan participants. Are you embedding something like a patient or something into that model? We are. are, so are? Okay, our, cool. our, our behind the scenes partner is patient spelled P A Y T I E N T. We know them well. And yeah. I, I was a very, actually that was a lucky guess. I did not know that, that in is, advance. But they, that's, they are yeah. our business partner that basically is providing the float, right? Yeah. Pay the provider in yeah. full and then collect and settle up with the patient a month later. But it's all embedded in one seamless experience, right? Show your ID card. You get one month monthly statement from your health plan. Um, all these behind the scenes business partners like patient mm-hmm. are really what helps us to make all this possible. Well, that's amazing. And it, actually, before we go to the employer route, I, I have some follow-ups because sure. I, want, I want to point out what you've essentially done is completely sort of dispelled the notion of high deductible health plans being these consumer driven health care uh, arrangements being the ideal way to get people to consume healthcare. This notion that if we offload a lot of the cost onto the employee, that they'll somehow make better buying decisions. But I think what actually happens is what you just alluded to is that, no, I'm delaying care. I'm not getting the care I need. I'm waiting until this develops into a chronic disease. And now I have to go to the hospital, even though I still can't afford it. But you've given me this impediment, this layer of cost that I'm now responsible for that is far and above what the average American is able to actually absorb anyways. That's right. So this, this is basically 
stopping that and flipping the switch completely yeah. on that model. And, and listen, we can run this model as a high deductible you can. Okay. qualified okay. model, but but you're, to your point, and I completely agree, and there are countless studies you know, over the last few years to show that just putting somebody into a high deductible plan and giving them more out-of-pocket financial responsibility does not necessarily you know, bend the trend curve or mm. create better health. Um, having more financial responsibility out-of-pocket without the tools to know which providers are the best and the support with a concierge to help you navigate to the top quality providers, that's what ends up producing a better result. And, you know, I think the over word, overused word by our industry of consumerism mm -hmm. is we tried to bring forward these consumer-based plans, but we didn't have a model that actually worked the way it does when you buy anything else in the real world. Yeah. Yep. I will admit... When we designed Simple Pay, we really didn't invent anything. We just made health insurance work like any other consumer yeah. purchase. You know the price, you know the quality, you get one monthly statement. It's well, that just, begs the question. Really that simple. Why did it take so long if it's such a simple idea? You know, um, I'm really grateful to, you know, organizations like Aetna Maritain mm -hmm. that, you know, that looked at this and said, you know, do we think of this as a disruption to our model or do we actually partner to try to transform the healthcare system? Um, and, and I'll just tell you, you know, a lot of the things we're doing behind the scenes around the plan design that aggregates for all covered medical and pharmacy services, you know, a actuarial plan design and a copay that covers everything that happens door to door. Like there were years of work and development yeah. to build that adjudication engine. I know it sounds simple, pay providers in full mm -hmm. and then send a monthly statement to the patient and give them 0% financing line of credit. Like all those things sound really simple, but I mean, this took us years yeah. to develop the technology, the integration to aggregate business partners, you know, to be able to, uh, to, to hopefully see, you know, our vision. Well, to, and I'm sure just make... industry forces, right, are up against it. So some headwinds, right, that you Yeah, and, and listen, so in addition to just the fact that this is like crazy hard to put together, yeah. we're, you know, is still an industry, you know, that represents about 20, 5% of the economy, if you look at healthcare, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are still institutions that would rather, you know, play the game of status quo because status quo pays really yeah, well. Absolutely. And, and we ran into some, th some of those headwinds. We actually started as a disruptor, um, you know, and, uh, and we realized that, you know, what we really should be is an enabler. Mm -hmm. Find organizations that want to work together you know, to try to solve the industry's problems and stop playing this game of industry musical chairs to try to knock each other out of the way to get a seat at the table. And instead, we're on a sofa here. On a sofa, and instead, yeah. let's get, all get on a sofa working together, mm -hmm. you know, to try to solve uh, the problems of our industry. I think a lot of, uh, you know, in our old days when I was on the, on the consulting advisor side, we used to ask uh, employers, you know, who do you think is the enemy in healthcare? You know, some, they'd sometimes say, well, it's the, you know, it's the, pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. you know, things are too expensive, or they might blame hospitals, they might blame insurance companies. And we say, no, the real enemy in healthcare is disease. And we need to all work yep. together to try to, you know, to try to cr use insurance to um, improve the quantity and quality of people's lives. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Well, I love it, right? And I think it is at the end of the day, we are rallying around trying to prevent disease, right? That's or trying right. to manage the disease better. I mean, that's why, again, I come up against fasting all the time or personal sort of accountability and exercise and taking care of yourself. Because that's, you know, you want to talk about how we could do that at scale is just get people's behaviors to change. No question. Uh, way well before they ever have to go into that's a right. hospital. Um, or or if when they need care, don't walk, you know, I've kind of not really spent a lot of time on, on our, our new understandings of quality. And mm -hmm. these are areas that Scott Shane Vogel, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bricker, you know, bring, you know, sort of national expertise in. Uh, but I will tell you the differences in provider quality is a massive gap. And I think we're on just on the start of bringing quality transparency to the industry. Okay. You know, the way I've, I've had Scott, you know, describe it to me, which resonates, is it's just like when we were back in school. You had some students that were at the top of their class, most in the bell curve, and a few from like, how did they make it from the last grade? And medicine is no different. Mm -hmm. And we have to get honest about differences in quality, um, get honest about how money motivates sometimes bad decision-making in medicine. Sure. Again, read the book, 
by Dr. Marty Macri, The Price We Pay. And I think those realizations have sort of been captured into the model that um, we bring forward with Simple Pay. Well, let's take it down to that employer level we were going to yeah, get to earlier. Yeah, no, there. no. I'm glad you stopped me before it was time to go that, that route. But I do want to actually talk about a real world application because then this is when that conceptual turns into the, the uh, applicable, right? That's uh, right. That's so, right. So, what type of employer is typically an immediate fit for this? You know, so we get this, we hear a lot from, you know, we, we, we obviously are introducing this usually to brokers and consultants mm -hmm, sure. around the country. And, uh, and then we get in front of the employer, you know, you know, with their, with their support. And we hear the question of, um, you know, this sounds too good to be true. You kind of said it a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. well, why haven't we done this before? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I'm like, hey, tap the brakes. There's, there's some things we're doing that we want to make sure culturally aligns okay. to determine whether this will be a good fit for your organization. Okay. And uh, they, they cover the two things we've touched on. One is ranking provider quality. We're not narrowing the networks, mm -hmm. kind of go wherever you want to go, but you now have this information to decide to what you want to do, realizing that there will be lower price tags to the patient if they go to higher quality providers. Some providers culturally need to check themselves and say, are we ready for that? Okay. Because they will have employees walking into their office saying, it's not fair that my doctor is ranked red. I've been going to them for you know 20 years, and now I'm being charged more. I always want to remind employers, we're not charging the patient more. We're just giving them finally the understanding of how this provider performs and practices medicine mm -hmm. actually ends up costing more. Okay. You just don't see it ahead of time. Um, we did have an employer we were presenting to, a large, well-known national employer, and uh, the, the chief human resource officer said, you know, I don't think it's right that our employees would be penalized because they went to a provider that we ranked red. Um, it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that in my mind and I said, not a good fit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's number one. Number two is the monthly statement that we send has tremendous benefits. Mm -hmm. No more bills or EOBs. One simple monthly statement. Zero percent line of credit. It's a, it's a, there's a lot going on there that's really important. But at the end of the month, you have to pay at least the minimum amount. If you don't, okay. you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to try to collect from the patient. So the days of getting your bills and EOBs and shoving them in a drawer for yeah. three or four yeah, months, yeah, yeah. like you can't do that in yeah. this model. As long as an employer can think through those and the, and the benefits we're bringing and they can get, you know, not just comfortable with it, but excited about what we're doing. That's but there's it. not coinsurance again, right? So there's not, so we're not talking... Uh, Ideally, we're not talking about a very large amount of monthly on a monthly a bill on a monthly state. No, I mean, it, but you listen, we're still running, you know, out of pocket, you know, responsibility mm -hmm. that might be in that actuarial level of okay. an eighty twenty plan, okay. you know, maybe a silver plan. So, so you're still doing, you're just paying it through individual copays mm -hmm. until you hit your out of pocket maximum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're just collecting it through copays, and you know, a hospital copay is not going to be you know, $10, right? So yeah. some of these copays are almost like okay. mini deductibles. So patients are still paying their out of pocket, but the difference between going to a hospital, using North Texas example, since that's where we're, you know, we're filming today, going to a hospital that is top quality for a clinical service line from one that maybe not so much, you know, it can be an over 60% reduction okay. in the overall spend. So your copays going to a top performing hospital is going to be much lower than if you went to a hospital that, you know, we would rank as, as, uh, as, as, okay. as red. And in the end of the day, this still has to be competitive, right? So this is still right. going to be price competitive uh, versus what they might traditionally get in a fully insured plan or a self-funded plan. So how do you kind of underwrite this in a way that yeah. still keeps it competitive in the market? I'll tell you the biggest thing for us as it relates to simple pay is results. Okay. If we're not delivering measurable results, like why would you do this? Uh, in fact, I'll go back and say in the days of Naturally Slim, we used to tell employers like implement this model. And if we don't return clinical lab values back to normal for this percentage of the group, then we will put our fees at risk. Okay. With simple pay, if we don't get individuals to shift towards top quality, we provide performance guarantees. Now, we've never missed on it right? It's human beings are very predictable. Go to open enrollment, explain to individuals that a lower copay to you doesn't mean cheaper healthcare. It means higher quality care. Mm -hmm. You know, just like JD Powers ranks motor vehicle reliability, a more reliable car, you're probably going to spend less money fixing it. Yep. It kind of works the same way in medicine. Um, what we've experienced, and this is probably the thing that is the most encouraging to us, is that employers are going from about 26% of their paid claims going to top quality 
uh, in the year before they implement Simple Pay. Okay. Last year, we ran at 86% of paid clients. Okay. And our, our biggest takeaway from this was, huh, Americans are great consumers of anything, mm -hmm. including healthcare, only when they have the information yep. and it's simple and they will on their own naturally select higher quality care. Well, yeah, I, I don't doubt that that's the case at all. I'm glad there's quantifiable data to show that, right? But you, you kind of had to do it on faith in the first couple of years. We did, you get back we up, did. Right? And, that, and that's kind of Scott's biggest motivation. Okay. He was like, at Compass, I couldn't get engagement rates to be at the level I wanted them to be. Yeah. Um, and we and we just figured out that getting rid of insurance complexity causes us to behave like we do when we buy anything else mm -hmm. in the real world, and that's why the eighty the eighty six percent number I don't mind telling you is way higher than our our hopes were, you know, for wild success. So so now that we've seen that, we know what's possible. Very consistent result yeah. that that applies by the way for blue collar, white collar, and gray collar populations. Well, I'm curious then. So let's say. We get critical mass, and you've got eighty-six percent. Maybe that number goes to eighty or ninety. Who knows the 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 range? But then, what does that do to those low-cost providers? Bottom line, right? Are they starting to get a noticeable drop in patients that are coming to their facilities? Then, if I'm that provider that's in red, how do I change my scoring? Right? I mean, I think some of those things I don't know if there's an answer for yet, but it's I can see the downstream impact to some of those lower uh, quality providers yeah. that might um, affect their businesses, right? Or That's might right. change their behavior, hopefully, uh, as well, right? You're, you're touching on an area that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go kind of dangerously to the okay, edge I know. On. Okay. So there's a nationally recognized health system, very well-known health system. Okay. And uh, we've been working with their leadership team. Uh, they are part of a large ACO insurance program that, you know, kind of creates those narrow networks mm -hmm. and, and meeting with their ACO, you know, several weeks ago, I asked him the question, I go, does your system in the aggregate deliver better quality than the providers that are not a part of your system? Mm -hmm. And he admitted, he said, listen, we got providers in our ACO that are high quality, average, and not so mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at how can we use the simple pay model to rank providers inside of their mm -hmm. ACO. Okay. And I think, the, I think where we are today is just a realization that we don't want to be hospital haters. We don't want to um, point the finger to providers that maybe aren't ranking as high as the enemy. You know, if you, if you kind of look at what's going on in medicine, we need to be leaning in and helping those providers, giving them scorecards to show them what they can do to improve. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to give up on that. Our industry, for the most part, has been focused on trying to empower the provider to perform better. Um, what we do with Simple Pay is we add to that, we add to that, empowering the patient to make better decisions. Okay. And I think, at the, at, I think the tide will rise for all. As patients choose higher quality, as providers see that shift towards top quality, those that maybe um, you know, could look at how they're practicing medicine you know, in a different way, I believe that we'll and that's see to say, that I like that because it doesn't have to be adversarial. It just goes, hey, here's a couple steps that you could actually take to improve your quality scores or yeah. a couple behavioral changes or billing changes or whatever those things are that are considered. It's not like it's an all or nothing and, well, you're stuck in red for the rest of your career. You have an opportunity right. to I'll, I'll, tell you, yeah. I'll tell you a story. I was talking with a broker. This is a great story, by the way. I was talking to a broker in Ohio um, a while back, and his brother is a neurosurgeon. And he said, hey, look up my brother. I'm going to see him over Thanksgiving. I want to know how he ranks. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, gee, this could end up yeah. going really poorly if he's not a green provider. And he wasn't. He was a, he was a yellow provider. Okay. And what we showed was he's practicing medicine beautifully. But where he's admitting his patients has an infection rate that's four times higher oh, wow. than the hospital across the street. So, you know, he shares this information with his brother over Thanksgiving, calls me the week after. And I'm like, oh, here it goes. Yeah, I'm, we're yeah. going to get, you know, we're going to get the pushback. And his brother said, you know, I always worried that there was an issue going on, that patients weren't having great outcomes. I'm actually going to do two things. I'm going to start admitting my patients to the other hospital. And I'm going to start putting a little pressure on the hospital that's underperforming yeah, yeah. to make sure that they're administering an antibiotic pre-op because that's what's driving a higher infection rate in their patients yeah. you know, that are being discharged. So, so again, I think that as we bring this forward, I think we'll see medicine well, improve that for sunlight's all. the best disinfectant and sometimes it's just casting light on these Ooh, issues. I'm going to steal that. That's, yeah, good. Yeah, that's, that's a good. good. That's one of my favorite <laughs> phrases. So uh, kinda, we'll kind of move towards the end of this here. Yeah. I, did, I will be remiss if I don't ask. Is this a fully insured plan? Is this a self-funded yeah. plan? Can it be both? So um, today we offer this on a national level. Okay. 
uh, again, in partnership with Aetna, mm -hmm. on the, adjudicated on the Maritain platform. Think of CVS Health, yep. Fortune 5 organization. Real champions for wanting to see improvements in the healthcare system where everybody wins, right? Plan sponsors, providers, and most importantly, you know, patients. So, so we're super encouraged about that. You know, like a lot of these, you know, innovative health plans, we've started on the self-insured mm -hmm. uh, space. We can technically go down as low as 51 employees okay. and can also offer this on a level funded chassis oh, as you well. Okay. Yeah. And I think over time you will see that this will expand into, you know, insured products. But but our focus out of the gate has been uh, to start there. Well, I love that, man. And so may, may I ask you, how does this differentiate with what I know in the market might be kind of similar, a bind? Yeah, uh, so, yeah. so, you know, we think of ourselves as an alternative health plan. Okay. Bind is an alternative health plan. Uh, so we kind of stole the acronym AHP away from Association Health Plan okay. to talk about alternative models like a bind, like a simple pay. You know, I might even put, you know, organizations like ELAP and reference-based pricing as alternatives to traditional insurance. Okay. And you know, um, Spencer, we kind of view the world from the eyes of, you know, the more uh, organizations that are coming to try to transform healthcare, that's good for our industry. Yep, I would agree. You know, so I, we think of them as uh, a Simon Sinek phrase, they're a worthy rival. Okay. Um, our models are, are quite a bit different on the surface, they look the same, but how we approach it, the things we're doing around the monthly statement, our measurements on quality, you know, some of the other tools and support that we put in on the clinical, uh, navigation and support, you know, we think, you know, has some unique, op you know, differences, you know, but clearly um, our model, you know, models like Bind are bringing new plan designs to yep. the industry that we think are going to be the next generation. Well, see, that's what I like. Yeah. Plan size is not the only one in my organization doing RFP software. Yeah. There's a couple right. of worthy foes, fr friendly competitors. I don't know if you want to call them friendly, but Frenemies. they're wor worldly adversaries. <laughs> but right. what comes as an aggregate outcome to this is that more and more people are exposed to the idea of software being applied to the that's RFP, right? right? That's so right. we all benefit from that. That's right. Even if some people choose us, some people choose others. That's right. This is becoming a normative thing in the marketplace That's for right. RFP. So yeah. I actually view that, and I've always said I think it's actually a good thing. So a couple of things. I, I, I usually ask, well, what do you think the future of healthcare is? It's very clear you've kind of put your stamp on what you believe the future is. But what would be the evolution, you think, yeah. over the next few years of the simple pay model more broadly? You know, I, I'll tell you for... Almost all my uh, years in healthcare, I've been, by the way, I'm 30 years in the uh, industry this week, you know, so this is actually my, my celebration nice. of uh, 30, well, years, 30 years in healthcare. No balloons or parties this week, yeah. but it was just, you know, kind of things where you start to reflect. You know, for almost all those years, we've been thinking about, you know, what does the future of healthcare look where patients are empowered, where providers are supported? And I think we're at the cusp of permanent and lasting transformation. The ability for providers to get out of billing collection and bad debt, yeah, to yeah. focus on practicing medicine, the ability for patients to have literally at their fingertips um, quality transparency that empowers them to make better decisions with financial support to pay their out-of-pocket costs. Mm -hmm. You know, healthcare is the second largest category of consumer debt in the country after, you know, college student loans and American families are drowning. When we bring these kinds of, you know, very uh, major uh, transformations into the industry, I believe we're going to look up, you know, you know, here in a couple of years um, and, you know, and, and see a lot of these shifts happen that I think is going to be, you know, great for, you know, great for our country. Well, I, great for our I, country. I certainly yeah. hope you're right. And I, I'm with you on that. So closing, closing thoughts, Wally, you know, kind of leave us with a, you're, you're really good with sound bites. You're really good with stories, <sighs> but leave me with your, what are your closing thoughts for the, the conversation we just had today? You know, I, I will just say, um, having been a part of a lot of startup companies in, in my, in my day and, you know, some that had, you know, great successful, uh, exits and such, you know, what we're doing here in transforming healthcare uh, is by far the hardest thing we've ever been a part of. So I'll take it from where we started. Um, I'm so blessed and fortunate to have a team of people that are passionate, they, they wake up every day and they're passionate about changing the world. You know, I think we, um, we use the word people, you know, incorrectly. I think we should be talking about the individual person. There's nothing more powerful than a person who wakes up every day and is just passionate about changing the world. Um, we call it the parking lot test. You know, when you get, when you okay. get to work and uh, you pull into the parking lot when we used to go into the offices, yeah, you know, yeah. pre-pandemic, um, you know, do you just dread when you're, mm. when you're in the parking lot going into the building or can you, do you just want to jump out of the car and run in because you can't wait to get started? If we've got a team of people 
that are passionate about changing the world, um, you know, regardless of their role in the organization, I'll tell you what, nothing can stop you. Well, and I, I feel that what you're describing. I've been in jobs before where that you get the Sunday scaries, as they call it. Where you, you don't want to. You, you don't want to go. I'm fortunate to be in a position now where I, I genuinely, my wife is, gets annoyed because I'm like, I, I want to go. I want it to be Monday. I, go. Give me the. I love. Up. I mean, I feel. I feel blessed that that's the case, man. No. I'm glad to see Thank you know you. your your uh, you know passion if, if for lack of a better way to wrap this yeah. up is palpable so thank you so much for your time thank you thank you for sharing the story and it's thank been you. a pleasure to get to know you man. thank you so much i right, appreciate it bye true captive believes in health care that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated check them out at truecaptive.com